Have you ever had a non-technical client or manager review your website only to give you feedback such as, I clicked the button and it broke? This just devolves into a long email chain trying to figure out what the heck they actually mean. And that was a trick question. The answer is yes, because it literally happens to everyone. But luckily, today's video sponsor, Bugherd, is here to help you solve that problem completely. Bugherd is the best way to get visual feedback and bug reports on your projects because it's built right into your browser where all that your team needs to do is point and click on an element on your page, which is going to capture that and allow you to leave reports and information on the bug or the visual change that you need. On top of that, all of the information and metadata surrounding that, such as the browser that the user's on, the style sheets and everything else is captured with that annotation that they place. So that way you can use all of that information combined with the report that they left in order to easily fix the bug without having to go through a mile long email chain back and forth for a week. Thanks again to Bugherd for sponsoring this video. Make sure you check out the link in the description to get a 14 day free trial with no credit card required. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Now in the intro, you saw me playing the beginning of Sweet Child of Mine. I'm just starting to learn that, so don't make fun of my terrible music ability because I have a long ways to go. But you'll notice that we had this visualizer to go along with it. We also had these different controls where we could change the bass, the mid, the treble, as well as the overall volume. And in this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to make this. And right now, you'll notice that the visualizer is actually picking up my voice through my microphone. When you watch back the edited version of my video though, I'm not gonna be using the output from this application. So if I change the mids, for example, or if I change the bass, it's not actually going to modify the sound of my microphone. It's only gonna modify the sound of my guitar, but they both go through the same interface in my computer, which is why right now you're showing, seeing it here. But I'm gonna edit that out so you don't have to listen to my voice when we change around all these different controls. Okay, now with that all out of the way, let's just get started with a simple index.html file and then we're going to need a script.js file because this is going to be all front-end work and it's actually a lot easier than you would think. So in this index.html, if we hit exclamation point and tab, that's Emmet is just going to generate this boilerplate for us. And if you're interested in how that actually works, I have an entire tutorial on it. I'll link in the cards and the description down below. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is just link up that script.js file. Make sure we add the defer attribute so it loads after our body. And that's pretty much everything we need up here. Now we can work on the content of our application. And it's gonna be fairly straightforward HTML. I wanted to make the styling minimal so that way you could make it as cool and styled as you want and really take this application to the next level. It's more so about the JavaScript. So this section is gonna be pretty straightforward. The first thing we need is a canvas, which we're just gonna give an ID of visualizer. And this is essentially this visualizer down here at the bottom that you see. This is what the canvas is going to be controlling. Now, the next thing we're going to need is a grid. And this one is going to have a class. We're just going to call it grid here. So we have a div with the class of grid. And this is what's going to contain all of our controls up here. So let's just create these different controls. Whoops. We're going to have a label. And this label is going to be for our volume. Just like that. And we're just going to say volume in here. Whoops, volume. And then we're going to have an input associated to that. So we can say input, and this is going to be a range input. And this input is not going to worry about the name. We don't really need that, but it is going to have an ID of volume. That way it matches up with our volume label here. I also want to make sure I put some min and max values on here. So the minimum value is obviously going to be zero, no volume at all. Our maximum is going to be one because this is decimal based. So that's like 100%. And then our default value is just going to be 0.5. And we want this to be a step here, whoops, step, which is just 0.01. So it's gonna change by 1% at a time when we move our little scroll bar. Now, if we just save this, open it up with live server, it's gonna pop up on the right-hand side here in just a second, and there you go. We see now, now we have this volume knob that we can change. And now let's get all of our other you know, knobs in here. So let's just copy this real quick. Our next one, if we go back to this page over here, is going to be for base. So let's just change this all around to be associated with base. It's going to be a range input. We're gonna have volume here. And what this is doing is instead of turning the bass on or off, what it's really doing is adjusting the loudness of the bass. So we're reducing and increasing the number of decibels essentially of our bass frequencies. So instead of a min of zero, that would be like no modification at all. We want our min to be negative 10. So this is going to reduce the decibels of all the bass tones by 10 dB. For the max, we're just gonna have positive 10. Our value here is going to be zero. 
And we're just gonna delete this step because by default, it has a step of one. So we're gonna be changing by one dB at a time. Now, if we save, come over here, we now have our base slider right here and our volume slider. Now let's get some more sliders in here. We can copy this down two more times because we're gonna have our mids. So let's just make sure we have mid and treble. I'm gonna say mid and treble. And here we're gonna have mid and treble. So now if we come over here, we should have all of our different sliders. It's obviously not looking very good right now. So the next step is to get it centered in the top like this. And that's actually fairly straightforward. We're just gonna do some styles here because we don't really have very many we need. So first, I'm gonna style our body. Now for the body, all I wanna do is change our background color. So we're just gonna come in here with a background color and we're just gonna do this DB, DB, DB color. Kind of this nicest gray color that you can see here. It looks pretty good. Now the next thing I wanna work on is that grid that we created. So we'll just say dot grid. And this grid is of course going to be a display of grid. And our grid template columns, we come over here, we just have two columns. And the first column is gonna be auto sized. It's essentially going to be as small as it can possibly be. And same with this, we're gonna set this to min content. Because if we set it to auto, it'll fill like the entire width. Min content is gonna make it as small as humanly possible. And just with that, we now have our two column layout set up. But you notice everything is kind of stretched out. So to fix that, we can just justify our content in the center and we can justify our items on the end. So now if we save, you're gonna notice that immediately is pushing everything to the center and it's lining all of our words up on the right hand side. That's what this justify items is doing. It's moving them from left aligned to right aligned, which looks a lot better. And then lastly, we can align our items in the center. And this is just gonna make it so that our text and our range input here are kind of lined up vertically in the same orientation. That just looks a little bit better. And now the reason right now this is pushed down so far is because we have this big canvas element up here. So let's select our canvas element. And what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna change the position to absolute. We're gonna change the top to zero, the left to zero, the width to be 100 view width, and the height to be 100 view height. We essentially want our canvas to fill up our entire page. So now our canvas is all of this space. It fills our entire page up. And the last thing we wanna do is right now we can't change our inputs because our canvas is over top of it. So what we can do with our canvas is we can change the Z index to negative one. That's gonna put it behind everything and we can set the pointer events to none. So that way, essentially our mouse does not interact with the canvas because we don't wanna interact with this. It's like a background element. It's not really a foreground element. Now, the last thing that we need to do on our grid here is add a little bit of spacing because it is super crunched together. So we're gonna set a gap of five pixels and 10 pixels. That gives us a little bit of space. And then on our input, we're gonna get rid of the margin that's on there by default. So we're just gonna say margin of zero. That makes everything look a little bit better in my opinion. Like I said, it's not beautiful, but it's good enough for what we're doing. And the whole point of this app is to focus on the JavaScript, which is what we're going to be doing right now. So the very first thing that I wanna do in here is to get all of these different elements. We have IDs on a lot of these, our visualizer, our volume, for example, our base, our, all that stuff. Let's just get all those elements. We're gonna do volume first. That's gonna be equal to document.getElement by ID of volume. We're gonna copy this down a couple of times because we're gonna have base, our mid, and we're finally gonna have our treble. And this is just gonna be here, base, mid, and treble. And then we're also going to have our visualizer. So we're gonna say visualizer is equal to document.getElement by ID of visualizer. And let's just make sure we spell that correctly. And there we go, we now essentially selected all of our elements. We haven't done anything with them, but we have access to them, which is exactly what we want. And now we can get onto the fun part, which is going to be actually integrating our audio into this. So let me just close out of our old application so we don't have any interference with that. And the next thing I wanna do is to create what's called an audio context. So we can just say new audio context. And this audio context is essentially where we're gonna control everything about our audio. We're gonna change our volume through here, our bass, our mids, our treble. We're gonna integrate the guitar into here, which will also integrate my microphone as well. And we can handle all of that and so much more through this audio context. So to get started, all we need to do is connect the input that we have in our case, our guitar, into this audio context. So let's create a function for doing that. We'll say a function which is gonna be called get guitar. That's gonna get our audio source. And we're also gonna create another function which is just gonna be called setup context. And this setup context function is where we're gonna integrate our guitar and get guitar is where we're going to get access to it. And this get guitar function is gonna be really simple. We just wanna say navigator.get user media and we wanna get an audio source. So we can just come in here and say audio, whoops, 
audio. And normally you would just set that to true if you want to get your you know normal audio source. But one problem with this is that some of the browsers actually do extra work to clean up your audio for you know voice speaking. But when you have an instrument, you don't want any of that extra cleanup. So we're going to turn all of that off. So echo cancellation, we're going to set that to false. We're going to set our auto gain control to false. We're going to set our noise suppression to false. And also we're going to set the latency to zero to give us the most real time experience of playing our guitar and hearing it out of our speakers. And again, you can do this with your voice to create like a voice changer app if you don't have an instrument on hand. So now this get guitar function is completely done. And inside of our setup context, we can actually use that guitar. So we can just say const guitar is equal to, and we need to await this because this returns a promise. So we're going to await that promise. And we're going to call get guitar. So to use async await, we need this to be an async function. And if you're not familiar with async await, I have an entire video on it. I'm going to link in the cards and the description below. So now with that done, we have our guitar and we can actually integrate this into our context. And to do that, we need to create a source. So we can say const source, this is going to be essentially our audio source for our context is equal to context.create media stream source. Whoops, not destination. Media stream source. And we just pass in here our stream, which in our case is this guitar here, because this is returning us an audio stream. And we're just creating a stream from this and now we're getting returned a source. And with that, we can just say source.connect, and we need to connect this essentially to our output, which in our case is our context.destination. That's going to essentially be the speaker for your computer. So now all that's left to do is just to call that setup context function. Now, if we save, come over here, you'll notice nothing's actually working. You know, I can play the string on my guitar and you won't hear anything coming through. And the reason for that is if we inspect our page, go to our console, it says failed to execute get user media on navigator three arguments required, but only one present. So if you see this error, what you need to do is this should be navigator.mediadevices.getUserMedia. Now, when we save this, come over here, it's going to ask us to use our microphone. We'll just click allow. And if we inspect, you might see an error in the console that says something along the lines of could not set up audio context. If I refresh, we might see this. There we go. The audio context was not allowed to start. It must be resumed or created after user gesture on the page. This essentially means that when a user goes to a page, they must interact with it first before you start up this audio context and start playing your audio. So to get around this issue, what we can do is before we set up our source or anything like that, all we need to do is have a simple if check to see if our context is started. So we can say context.state is equal to suspended. If this is true, then that means our context is currently not playing. And all we want to do is await context.resume. So this is going to try to start up our context. So as soon as someone interacts with our page, it'll essentially start the context for us. And now if we go to inspect, you can see that we no longer have that error. And hopefully when I play my guitar string over here, we should actually hear noises being played. So now instead of tackling the easier task of doing these volume and bass knobs, I want to actually do the more fun task, which is setting up that really cool visualizer. It's more difficult, but it's super fun. So I really want to get started on it. So let's create a new function which we're just going to call draw visualizer. Whoops, draw visualizer. There we go. And in this function, the very first thing that I want to do is request an animation frame with the exact same function. What this is going to do is set up essentially a loop where it's going to loop through at about, you know, 60 frames per second, our function draw visualizer, and it's going to constantly update the visualizer for all the new different audio forms. So when we play a note, you can see the updates in real time. And it's just going to loop through this essentially infinitely because we have no way to break out of it. And that's okay, we want the visualizer to be there permanently, always updating as long as the user's on the page. Now inside of here, we need to do a little bit of fancy work to get out the different frequencies of our audio context. So right now we just have a context, we don't have any way to get the information from it. We need to create what's called an audio analyzer. So let's just come in here, we'll create, whoops, an analyzer node. So we'll say analyzer node equals new analyzer node. And we need to pass it in the context that we're using to create this. And we can also pass in some options. And I want to pass in the option FFT size. And we're going to pass 256. And this number is essentially how many different frequencies you want to control. If you pass it a really large number, you're going to have very small frequency ranges, which means you're going to have a lot of different frequencies that you see in your graph. While with a larger number, it's going to consolidate the frequency in, into larger bands. So, you know, maybe from 10 dB to 50 dB in this scenario, or if you had a number of like 1000, you would now have 1000 discrete measurements. So maybe it would only go from 10 to 20, for example. And I can show you the difference when we actually start visualizing and drawing out this graph. But 256 works really well because it's 
large enough that it is visually appealing, but it's small enough that you can really see changes in your different frequencies. So now inside of our draw visualizer, we have this analyzer and we need to connect it first to our context. So inside setup context, let's just do our connect. So we, right before our destination, we just say connect analyzer node. So now we're actually analyzing the information of the audio coming from our audio context. And in here, what we can do is actually get that frequency information. So we're gonna say buffer length is equal to analyzer node, oops, analyzer node dot frequency bin count. And this is going to essentially give us a number for how many different frequencies we're going to be measuring. The next thing we're gonna to wanna to do is to create an array. So we can say data array is equal to a new, and we want this to be a u int eight array because it's just going to be eight bit unsigned integers that are going to be returned to us. So we have our data array, and we want it to be the same length of our buffer right here, because this is how many different frequencies we're getting from our analyzer node. And then finally, we can populate that array, because right now it's an empty array, by saying get byte frequency data, just like this, and we pass it in our data array. So now this array is essentially populated with the value that corresponds to how loud that particular frequency is, and this frequency bin count determines how many different frequencies we are actually measuring. So now what we can do is actually draw this on our canvas. So we need to get the width and the height of our canvas, which is just equal to visualizer.width. And we can do the same exact thing down here for height. That's gonna be our visualizer height. And now we need to determine how wide each one of the bars in our visualizer are going to be. So we can say bar width. And this is actually fairly straightforward. All we need to do is take the width of our entire graph in our case, the width of our visualizer, and we're gonna divide it by the number of you know, different frequencies we have, which is our buffer length. This gives us an evenly segmented number so we can see exactly how many frequencies there are. And if we increase our frequency bin count by updating this FFT, we'll have you know, a smaller bar width, or if we decrease it, we'll have a wider bar width to make sure it fills the entire space. And again, I'll show you that in a little bit once we get the frequency you know, visualizer up and running. Now, the very last thing we need to do is actually get our canvas. So we'll say our canvas, context is equal to visualizer dot get context. We're going to be getting a two dimensional context. So we'll pass in 2D here. And then all we want to do is just clear it. So let's say canvas context dot clear rect zero zero width and height. So this is going to go from the bottom left corner, bottom top corner, I'm sorry, at the top left corner. And it's just going to draw a rectangle clearing out this entire canvas, which is exactly what we want. Now we can loop through our data array and just say for each item, and we're gonna get the index as well because we're gonna use that inside of our calculation. Now what we can do is draw each one of our frequency bar graphs. It's essentially just a vertical rectangle. And all we need to do is get our top Y position. And this top Y position is going to be equal to our item, which is our frequency essentially. That's this right here inside of our array. It's the like strength of our frequency. And what we wanna do is we wanna divide that by 255. That's going to give us a number between 0 and 1, because 255 is the maximum value for our frequency, and 0 is the lowest value. So this is going to give us a value between 0 and 1. And then to scale that to the height of our document, we can just multiply that by our height. So this is going to draw a bar from either the very bottom of our page all the way up to the very top of our page. But we don't want a bar that tall. We only want the bars to go halfway up our page. So we can instead divide by 2 here. And that's just going to have our height, so the max height of our bar is going to be half the height of our page. Now to get our X position, this is actually pretty easy. We just take the width of each individual bar and we multiply it by the index that we're currently on. So if we're on the 10th value, it's gonna be 10 times the width of our bar, which essentially moves us over 10 bar placements. Pretty straightforward. Now we can actually draw this. So we can say canvas context dot fill style. This is going to be what color we do. For now, I'm just gonna print out all of these as black bars. So we'll just do RGB 000. Just for now, we're gonna change it to make it super cool and colorful in a little bit. I just wanna get it on the screen. Now to actually draw this, we'll do a fill rect. It's gonna start at our X position. That's like where our X is going to be. And our Y position is just our height minus our Y because we want it to be the bottom half and not the top half of our graph. So if our Y was zero, for example, it'd be all the way up here. But when we subtract that from our height, we're gonna be pushed all the way down here, which is exactly what we want. Now we're going to determine the width of this, which is just going to be our bar width, and the height of this, which is just our Y element here. So now with all of that done, we're drawing out our elements. We can click save and see if this actually works. And of course, it's not going to do anything yet because we need to call our draw visualizer function. We'll just call that up here, click save, and there you go. You can see that we have our graph being drawn out. I can play a note on my guitar, and you can see that it draws that out. Play a higher note, and it looks a little bit different. So we know this is working, but you'll notice that a, it's super fuzzy, 
and B it's entirely black which looks pretty terrible. So let's first fix this black color and then move on to fixing the fuzziness because this black color is really easy to fix. All we need to do is use HSL and inside of here we're going to have some kind of value here then we're going to have 100% lightness and 50% or I'm sorry 100% saturation 50% lightness this is going to give us like the brightest color possible and then here for our actual hue what we need to do is determine how tall our bar is and the taller it is the more we're going to shift the hue so a super low bar is going to be red and then we want to shift up to some bluish purpley color up here and if you remember correctly, hue goes from 0 to 360, where 0 is red, and then you go all the way through all the colors back to 360, where it is again red. So we don't want to go from 0 to 360, we want to go from maybe 0 to 200. 200 is like a bluish color, so that'd be a good stopping point. So what we can do for that is we just take our y point, and we divide it by our height. This is going to give us essentially a value which is proportional to the height of our screen. So if y, for example, is 50, and our height is 100, this is going to give us 0.5. And then all we need to do is multiply this by that constant of 200, which is going to be our maximum value possible. But if you remember correctly, we divided our height by 2 here. So essentially all we need to do is re-add that 2 back in so that we can go from 0 to 200. So instead this could just be, you know, 400 because that's what 200 times 2 is. So this is going to give us a hue between 0 and 200 for a value. And that's going to give us either red all the way up to blue. Now if I save immediately, you can see we get those really cool looking colors where it's blue as it's towards the top here, and you know, we got green and yellow and red as we go down. So if I play a note here, you can see we get that nice blue, and I can play a higher note and you can see, you know, that makes the frequencies that are higher up actually move. Now for fixing this fuzzy look that you can see, you know, it's kind of got this fuzzy, not quite perfectly crisp look, we're going to create a function called resize, which we're going to call every time we resize our screen, and all we need to do is take the actual width of our context and we need to set it. So right now we have the width of our context being set in CSS, but we're not actually setting it on our canvas itself. So here we're going to set the width equal to the CSS width, which is just our client width. That's going to be the actual width of it on our screen. And we need to multiply that by window dot device, whoops, device pixel ratio. So this is going to make sure that if you have a screen that is really high in pixel density, it's going to take into account that pixel density. We can do the exact same thing for our height. So we can come in here and say height. And we can say that this is going to be our client height. And now if we save and make sure that we call this resize function, we'll just do it all the way up here. Resize. You can now see that this looks much crisper than it was before. So I'm just going to clear that out. You can see it's got a kind of fuzzy look to it. And now when we add that back in, it has much crisper looking bars, which looks way better. It may be a bit difficult to tell the difference on YouTube, but I can assure you looking at it in person, it is a massive difference. And now with these bars here, let's actually take into account what it looks like if we increase or decrease this number. Let's just say we had a really low number. For example, we're going to have this number. So we're going to go to 128 and we save. You now notice our bars are twice as thick as they were before. So we have wider bars, which means they encapsulate a larger frequency band and it's kind of more of an average as opposed to if we increase this drastically, for example, let's say we go to 1024, that's about four times as large, and we save, you can see we now have very small frequency bands. And something cool about this is if I play a note on the guitar, you can see that it kind of spikes up different points along the line, and that's because a note is actually just a wavelength, and it's popping up all the different points where that wavelength actually meets inside of our frequency band. So you think like a sinusoidal wave, it's actually showing that inside of these wavelengths because we have such granularity. But generally, when you have a visualizer like this, you don't really want that granularity. So this 256 looks much better. It smooths things out, and it looks really good overall. So now the next step is actually going to be one of the easier ones for our application, and that's going to be setting up the event listeners so that all of these different knobs do something. And the very first event listener I want to set up is actually going to be an event listener that's associated with this resize function. Because right now, we only resize once, but what happens if I change our browser size? like this for example, it's going to make this slightly blurry because it doesn't quite have the correct width being set. So what we need to do instead is set up an event listener for that. So we can just create a function called setup event listeners. There, oops, I cannot spell, there we go. And inside of here, the first one we'll do is window.addEventListener for resize, and we're just going to call that resize function. So now no matter what we do with our application, whether we make our window very wide or we make it very narrow, it's going to make sure that these elements are perfectly crisp at all sizes. And that's exactly what we want. Let's just make this a little smaller so we can actually see all of our code. Now the next thing to do is we're going to do our volume knob. So we can say volume.addEventListener 
on input that's going to occur any time that we change our knob. And we want to just call this. And all we need to do is convert this to a float. So we can say const value equals parse float of e dot target dot value. This is going to take that string value of zero to one, convert it to an actual float number so we can use it in our application. Now the next step is to actually change the volume of our audio context up here. In order to do that, we need to create something called a gain node. This is essentially how you change the volume. And we can set our gain node, pass it in our context, and for our default gain, we're just gonna pass in our volume dot, whoops, volume dot value, just like that. So now inside of here, we can say gain node dot gain dot value, and we can set it equal to our value. Now, in order to get this to work, let's just call setup event listeners. And let's make sure that inside of our setup context, we apply that gain node. And we wanna do this before our visualizer so that all of our changes to our gain, our volume essentially are you know, visualized in our visualizer. If we do the visualizer before, it won't actually pick up on the volume changes. So now if we save that, you can see that if I change the volume, this visualizer is changing at zero, obviously it's zero. And as I go way up here, you can see that now my visualizer is peaking much higher and here it is peaking much lower. And you'll notice though a slight problem. If I play a note, you may hear some popping or clicking sounds when I change the volume. I'm not sure if you heard any of those clicking or popping sounds, but one issue is if you change your value drastically between one value and another value in a short period of time, the computer essentially has a hard time of making that jump. So it, you know, sometimes has a pop or a click to get to that new value. But luckily, you can actually fix that really easily by calling a function here called set at target time. We give it our value here, which is where we want to be. We give it our start time, which is just our current time or our context. Then we give it essentially a change value, so 0.01. So what this is going to do is give us a nice smooth change of our volume, and it's not gonna give us those weird clicking sounds. So again, I can change, you know, I can play a note here. And if I change my volume, you know, hopefully you don't hear any clicking sounds. And you may not have heard any before, and it was just, you know, dumb luck that it didn't happen, but doing this is going to be much better and making sure you don't have any weird clicking or popping sounds. Now with that done, let's move on to our next section, which is going to be setting up the base. So instead of volume here, we're gonna add a vent listener for our base. And we wanna make sure we parse this to an integer because we know that this is always between negative 10, positive 10, and it's always gonna be an integer. But instead of setting our you know, gain node, what we need to do is take our base EQ. We'll just call it base EQ. And this base EQ is going to modify the EQ, essentially the volume of different frequencies. So up here, let's create that base EQ. And this is going to be equal to something called a bi-quad filter node. We'll pass it in our context. And here we specify all of our different options. So for our base, we want to modify our very low frequencies. So we can set a value of our frequency to 500. And by default, this doesn't do anything on its own when you just set this to 500. You also need to specify a type. And in our case, we want to do everything underneath the frequency 500. So we use a low shelf. What this does is it modifies everything under the frequency 500. And gain is just going to be essentially how much we increase or decrease that by, which is just the value of base. So we'll say base.value here. So now if I save this, make sure down here we apply our base. We'll just put it all the way up here. So we'll connect our base EQ. Now we hopefully should be able to see changes in base. If I max this out, you should hopefully see the base section increase. I'll play a note. And when I decrease it, you should see that decrease. This did not really make any noticeable change though. So obviously we have an error. Let's just see if we do. In our console, you see we have uncaught reference base EQ is not defined on line 31. Looks like here I just spelled base wrong, wrong type of base there. So now let's make sure we don't have any errors, nothing in the console. So now if we change this base and I lower it by a bunch, you should see these bars are lower. So I'll play a note. And as I increase the base, you should see it increase. Just like that. So now we're able to modify those base frequencies. We saw this bottom section increased and decreased as I changed my base slider. Let's do the exact same thing, but we're gonna do mid for example. And this is going to be a mid EQ. And down here, we wanna make sure we have our mid EQ. And mid is actually going to be slightly different than base in the way that we set this up. It's gonna be similar, but a little different. We're using the same bi-quad filter node. Our frequency here, we'll just use 1500 as a nice value. We want this to be our mid value. But instead of doing a low shelf, because we don't wanna do everything under it, and we can't do what the opposite of a low shelf is because we don't want to do everything above it either. We want to do kind of a range around this 1500. And that's what something called peaking is used for. 
So peaking essentially says we're going to have a peak and it's going to raise up at this 1500 and slowly die off until we don't have any further change at all. So it's going to kind of have a range that it's going to do between, you know, 1500, same on both sides, where it's going to increase or decrease our volume. And to determine how far that range spreads out, we use a factor called the Q. And essentially, the smaller you make this, the larger your range is going to be. And the quicker you make it, the harsher it's going to drop off and the shorter that range is going to be. So for us, we're just going to use a nice value here of math of square root 1 over 2. So it's the square root of 0.5. This is going to be a nice and small number that gives us a large enough range without overlapping in our base and our high sections too much. So now hopefully, we should be able to see this take effect now that we have everything set up. Let's just again, make sure we have no errors, nothing in the console at all. So now over here, whoops, not treble. What we can do, I'll play a note. And now we can change our mid up and down. You should see it make a little bit of a change in this section down here. There we go. So now the very last thing to do is essentially the exact same thing, but with treble. So copy this down one more time. But instead of mid, we're going to have treble. And instead of mid EQ, we're going to have our treble EQ. And we're going to add in our treble EQ here. And up here, I'm going to copy this base one because base and treble are almost exactly the same. The only difference is that this is going to be a high shelf instead of a low shelf. So it's going to be everything above a certain frequency. And we obviously want to have a larger frequency of 3000, for example, and change our treble value. Now, hopefully, if we did everything correctly, let's inspect. Console looks good. If I come over here, I'll play a note, for example. And it's a little bit harder to see. I'll try it one more time. But you can see kind of these frequencies over in this section, they'll raise up and lower down just a little bit. You see a minor change. It's a little bit harder to tell for sure, but it's definitely making a difference. And that's all it takes to make this awesome visualizer slash amplifier inside of your browser. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my other videos linked over here and subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Thank you very much for watching and have a good day.